So we're going to start off by looking at the wonderful world of complex groups. I'm just going to give you the main highlights, the main issues that we need to be aware of. In terms of the types of complex group that we can see, there's a vertical where we've got A has control of B, has control of C, and we then have what's sometimes referred to as the D-shaped or the mixed vertical group where we might have A having 60% of B and then A has 20% um, of C and B has 35% of C and let's say in this first one I've got 90% and 70% and we would say here in both cases C is a subsidiary of A because A controls a majority of C's shares. Now in terms of um, any narrative in an exam question you will be very very bored of me saying by the end of these four days if you've not heard me heard it say already my favorite word in the exam is the word because and the reason why I like the word because is it converts what's into y's. So I could have simply said in both cases C is a subsidiary of A. And that's a statement. But you add the word because and that statement becomes an explanation. And if you take a look at the exam requirements it's often discuss or explain. So it's forcing you to give that explanation. So get into that habit of using because and the other habit I want you to get into is that I don't want to see any answers which are more than three lines long. Okay, ideally two. Because the way that you get marked in ACCA is that you get one mark for each correct point that you come up with. So what you want to do is to make a large number of small correct points to pick up a large number of individual marks. In terms of technique, it's the standard approach for groups. And you think about what the standard approach is, we apply the single entity concept. So we're going to assume that all the companies in the group aren't separate legal entities. We're going to treat them all as if they are simply one company. We eliminate intra-group items. We only want to show transactions between the group and the outside world. goodwill arises upon consolidation and remember as far as goodwill is concerned we have the proportionate method and the fair value method goodwill and I should also of course add the non-controlling interests
the shear capital is that of the parent only. The share capital of the subsidiary forms part of the subsidiary's net assets. Because net assets is assets less liabilities, and what's asset less, assets less liabilities equals equity. So that's why we use the equity figures in our net assets working, because it's equity is in fact assets less liabilities. In terms of workings, it's the usual workings but in working number one create a table to allocate profits between the group and the NCI. So if we have an example, if we've got that situation of a of a complex group whereby I've got a has 60% of B and what did we say I think we said that A has 25% of C and B has 30% of C when we produce our little table A has a direct investment in B and C it has 60% of B shares and it has 25% of C shares. And then indirectly it is 60% of B's 30% which is a further 18. We add those two together. So in terms of the profits we would allocate 43% of C's profits to A. And the way to think about the NCI is we simply give them the balance. They have the residual. So that's going to give them 40% of B and 57% of C. So when you come to do your profit allocation and we say well what's going to happen to the profits which have been made by the subsidiary since the date it joined the group? That's what we put three. The cost in the what I refer to as the sub subsidiary, or you might refer it to it as the indirect subsidiary, is allocated between goodwill. and the NCI of the direct subsidiary. And the bit that confuses people is that this is subtracted from the NCI of the direct subsidiary. And the reason why it's subtracted is you think about it, a cost of an investment, that's a debit, isn't it? You know, when I buy some shares, I go credit cash, debit cost of investment. So now I'm going to take that cost of investment and I've got to take it out of cost of investment, so I'm going to credit cost of investment and I'm going to debit it to something else. So I'm going to debit it to goodwill, which is the group's part and then I'm going to debit it to the non-controlling interest. Now what is the non-controlling interest? The non-controlling interest is part of equity and equity is a credit entry. So you see that if I'm putting a debit on an item which is a credit entry it's subtracting because that's what you do in, in T-accounts, you're actually subtracting all the time. 
quick example. X acquired 70% of Y for $100 million on the first of the first X3. Y acquired 80% of Z. We're on Z's or we're on Z's? You're, you're, okay, you're chilled. Okay, I, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm a Z man myself, but I, I know when I teach in New York, I say the word Z, and it's Kieran, get back on the plane. Okay, so Y acquired eighty percent of Z for a hundred and twenty million dollars on the first of the first X five. So if we had our goodwill calculation, we have a goodwill calculation for Y and a goodwill calculation for Z. And we'd also have an NCI calculation for Y and for Z. And we'd say in terms of the cost of the investment, we have a direct cost in Y and what are we preparing? We are preparing the consolidated accounts of X, aren't we? So we say, well, how much does this investment cost X? Cost X 100 million, because X went out and bought those shares. But we have an indirect cost in Z, because X controls that investment, doesn't it? But X itself did not go out and buy those shares. Who bought those shares? Y bought those shares? And we own 70% of Y. So what I'm going to say here, my indirect investment in Z is 70% of 120 so that's going to be 84. Who has also bought some of the shares in Z? It's the non-controlling interests of Y. So therefore I'm going to go to the non-controlling interests of Y and we say share of the indirect cost in Z. They own the other 30% of Y that investment cost 120 million so we put in that figure of 36 million but notice I've put that in as a negative figure and then you do your traditional non-controlling interests and group reserves nonsense Just a quick word about dates. Dates are really important items in ACCA consolidation question. You know that question number one is going to be something to do with groups. I don't know what it's going to be. Could be complex groups, disposals, step acquisitions, currencies, or or cash flows. Yeah, effectively, you've got a choice of one out of five. And the indirect subsidiary is acquired on the later of the two acquisition dates by the ultimate parent. So 
So you will be given dates. Remember, in this exam, you have 15 minutes of thinking time at the start of it where you can't actually write on your answer paper. So I would be going through, and I don't know whether you bring a highlighter pen in with you or are you just going to underline bits, but I'd be looking at the dates, I'd be underlining the dates, making sure that I'm familiar with those dates. So in my head, I'm starting to draw a picture of the relationships within the group. So D acquired 60% of E on the first of the first X4. E had acquired 80% of F on the first of the first X2. Therefore, D has acquired control of F on the first of the first X4. But the chances are the examiner might have told you F's retained earnings on the 1st of January X2 and one of the hardest things for us to do as students is to look at a number and say that's irrelevant I don't need that in the exam I honestly think that is one of the most challenging things we have to face because it's drilled into us that every number is there for a reason sometimes those numbers are there and they're trying to fool us okay so that's a, a very brief 